ladies and gentlemen, it's a true privilege to be with you today. And uh, my gratitude, of course, uh, goes to the organizers, the in Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP and its director, Oscar Garcia, the Global Evaluation Initiative of the World Bank, our hosts, uh, Giuseppe Casali uh, and the International Training Center of ILO, uh, the Italian government, uh, of course, and the municipal government of beautiful Torino. Uh, greetings to all present here today, to the ones that are following online, ministers, experts, academics, and the evaluation community. And believe me, I would prefer to be a keynote listener here because you are the experts. It's not easy to come uh, after the wise words of experts and practitioners. I must confess that I feel a little intimidated by the clarity and the depth of what we have heard in the opening speeches today. And it is impossible, of course, uh, to avoid agreeing with every word. And um, it is also dif difficult not to repeat what we have heard this morning. I would like, uh, of course, to start by, in a way, paraphrasing what we have just heard. First, we heard loud and clear, the world is facing a profound interconnected and simultaneous crises that span from the COVID-19 pandemic and its social and economic consequences uh, to the climate emergency, the extinction crisis, transactional inequalities, wars, human security stress. And I could go, believe me, on and on. Um, and as I often say, of course, these are not the problems, but rather symptoms of a more profound and systemic civilizational breakdown that requires a whole of society, a whole of government approaches. And of course, it needs our multilateral system. It needs a bold global multilateral response. That calls, of course, for collective action, for creativity, for responsibility. Number two, the outlook, the outlook, and we heard from you, from the speakers uh, online, the outlook is bleak. We know it. The COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine have unleashed an exponential increase in the cost of living due to the triad that we all know, energy, food, and financial crises together. Uh, and uh, the last uh, UN report on SDG implementation is really disheartening. You mentioned uh, the, the report on, uh, on uh, the European uh, implementation of, of SDG, but I'm talking about the global outlook. And uh, the truth is that the numbers are disheartening. And there is an evident backsliding in almost every SDG. Let me share some numbers, some more numbers. 93 million were pushed into extreme poverty only in 2020. We, the current national climate commitments, instead of achieving the Paris Agreement target to peak emissions by 2025 and reach net zero by 2050, the trend shows steady growth of emission growth of emissions with a rise of 14% by 2030 today the world is facing the most significant number of violent conflicts since 1946 one quarter of the world population is living in conflict affected areas and 100 million have been forced to flee from their homes as May of this year. And we already know, we know it, you know it. The highest price is always pays, paid by the most vulnerable, women and girls, children, indigenous peoples, migrants and refugees, persons with disabilities, the elderly, 
And here again, child labor and child marriage numbers have seen unprecedented growth. Gaps and inequalities are persistent. A woman in sub-Saharan Africa has around 130 times higher risk of dying from causes relating to pre related to pregnancy or childbirth than a woman in Europe or North America. That's inequalities in one phrase. Number two, number three, we often hear and we heard from the very comprehensive and forward-looking report from the UN Secretary General called our common agenda that we need a new social contract. Local, national, global contracts for that matter. And I, I cannot agree more. We need to recommit to the basic principles of the UN founding charter, cooperation, solidarity, peaceful coexistence, and respect for human rights. It all comes down to, and if you allow me, I would like to paraphrase and adapt a little bit President Roosevelt for fundamental freedoms. Freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from speech and worship. And I would add one more. This is freedom to live in harmony with nature. This leads us to the obvious question of what to do, how to face these challenges and do it together, how to do it. And the paradox is that we live in the most sophisticated and prolific technological revolution. We have the knowledge, we know more and better. And we have the means, the resources, the power, even if they are unevenly distributed. And so why can we not act? Why can we not respond, decide, and simply exercise our instinct of self-preservation? That's the question I ask myself and I ask us all. Why are we not able to learn from experience and not to repeat the same mistakes of the past? And of course, the answer is not so straightforward. There is a great difficulty in bridging the political, the economic, the cultural dimensions of decision-making and problem-solving and identifying what is holding us back as humanity. And I strongly believe that we have only two choices, only two choices. We have the option to either stay in paralysis because the world is in such a chaos and just be in despair, <laughs> or we can decide to resolve to act and do it collectively and use this crises as levers for transformation. And that's why we're here today together. A great example of what humanity can do, what our international community can do when we act collectively and responsibly is the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, we need we need the same spirit, the same drive, the same leadership. So against this backdrop, I propose three key words for us to reflect on. Uh, and these three key words uh, to build resilient and robust evaluation system um, are time, scale, and impact. Let's, let's start with time. For disconnected time cycles that call for adaptive, flexible, and yet highly institutionalized evaluation systems, these four unmatching time cycles are political, are social, are ecological, and crisis cycles. 
First, a political cycle is frequently related to a government's term and its public policy planning and evaluation performance, typically for four or five years. And this is also associated with the political stability of countries. And we know that we are not performing that well on that front either. Second, the cycles of social change and adaptation. The time for societies to learn, to adapt, and to respond to a particular policy or normative decision. It takes time. It takes often longer time spans than the political cycles. For example, policies on using single-use plastics or energy austerity, etc. Third, the times of nature to adapt to abrupt changes, to simply survive or regenerate. For example, massive deforestation or the changes in the atmosphere that cause climate change. These are long-term cycles that require both shock and urgent decisions and long-term planning and evaluation. And fourth, and it is perhaps the most significant challenge of our times, which is how to govern, govern in constant iterated crises and emergencies. It happens that today, making decisions in the midst of an emergency has become the new normal. The government representatives here know, know that very well. Perhaps the best example is how communities, how local authorities, national governments, and multilateral institutions responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic was a magnifier of the dysfunctions of our societal ar uh, arrangements. Institutional designs, the vulnerabilities of our societies, it all came out, you know, in, in a big way, in a magnified way. Regardless of a country's GDP or population, the pandemic found us unprepared and called for the need to craft more resilient and adaptive systems to face emergencies. And we're not speaking about only the need for robust national health systems, but we're also talking about global supply chains, transport, adequate means to learn and make critical decisions and do so using virtual means. At the UN, for example, the General Assembly, and I follow that closely, of course, had to adapt its own technology and modalities to allow for remote voting and remote approv uh, approval of resolutions. The issue here and the learning here is how to address the challenges of the simultaneity of crises and responses from the policy and the political perspective, and also about challenges about prioritizing and harmonizing decisions between urgency and mid and long-term structural interventions and transformations. That's, that's where evaluation comes to play. Of course, the challenge, the challenge is how to align these different time spans. One way, of course, is to close the knowledge policy practice and power gaps. And for that, we need well-informed, responsible and active citizenship. We need adaptive, resilient and effective planning and evalu evaluation ecosystems that require solid institutions and social ownership. And we need systems and institutions that outlive specific governments and evaluation and structures that are built in the planning, the practices, the organizational culture, and our governance architecture. Evaluation is about preventing, anticipating, pro uh, proposing at the same time that it learns about the past, and you know that much better than me because you are the experts. The number two keyword is scale. If we go back to the idea of a troubled world, 
of interconnected, interdependent, and simultaneous crises. We know that we need cross-scale solutions. We can take any example. Let's go back to the example of COVID-19 or climate change. The role of communities, of local governments, of national governments, of parliaments, of regional integration bodies and global multilateral institutions all have a role to play. They have specific mandates. They're accountable to different constituencies. However, policy coherence and mutual accountability are not a given. Policy and decision-making on different scales are often disconnected, contradictory, and even duplicative. Therefore, planning and evaluation ecosystems should allow for weaving across the scales, a bottom-up and a top-down flux to foster greater coherence and cooperation, more effective accountability and transparency, and better implementation capacity of global agreements like the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on financing for development. I would say, therefore, that um, an effective global evaluation ecosystem is an essential component of global governance. Multi-level governance arrangements are the best way to address some of the most pressing deficits of our institutions and governing systems. The implementation, and what, what are these challenges? Implementation, inclusion, participation, and accountability deficits. I'm sure that you all have examples uh, of the lack of complementarity and career, uh, and career coherence in how it can really affect performance and delivery in our sustainable development project. The idea of a whole of government and whole of society approaches to crisis solving is written down, and you know better than me, in almost every good governance manual. But we also know that political tensions and um, differing views and priorities among levels of government are frequent, especially in highly polarized political environments. Let me give you a very concrete example here. We know that cities consume nearly 80% of the world's energy and produce around 60% of the global emissions. So in most countries, local authorities are primarily responsible or share ex essential aspects of public policy to regulate energy production and emissions. This means that the energy transition, the national plans we have set up for ourselves must adjust to the global goals established in the, in the Climate Paris Agreement and include cities and local governments if we want to ensure implementation and if we want to ensure that we stabilize our climate. Once again, resilient, adaptive, well-institutionalized planning and evaluation systems are vital to ensure coherence in delivery capacity. I would even say that robust evaluation systems can and should help bridge the scale short circuits that we experience and even broker conflict solving. The number three, and I'm almost there, so just bear with me, is impact. And I would add impact and transformation. I want to bring this third keyword or rather keywords to your attention, uh, perhaps because one of today's most critical issues is the trust deficit of people in institutions and in the capacity of those leading these institutions to deliver the rights and the services that they expect and deserve. The steady growth of poverty, we heard, unemployment, insecurity, fiscal stress, not only in the developing world, but also now in the developed countries, has have caused disenchantment, a breach of citizens' trust in institutions. And this is true for local service providers, for parliaments, for national public service, to the global institutions, including our United Nations. 
Recent surveys uh, demonstrate a growing lack of confidence in governments among citizens. For example, a, a recent OECD study from only last July shows that only four out of 10 people trust their governments. And in my own region, in Latin America, uh, eight out of 10 people do not trust political parties. This means that our democracies are in trouble. And trust building is, of course, it is connected to making institutions and democracies deliver for people. Electoral democracies, we know it, are not enough anymore. They are not enough. Democracies face a performance problem solving deficit. This means that there is a participation, this, a need, uh, sorry, to, to harmonize legitimacy through informed and sustained citizens' participation with efficiency in public decision making. And of course, accountability is critical to this. Again, let me repeat, robust and institutionalized evaluation systems should be at the center of trust building and accountability. This means that evaluation cannot be, cannot be a simple technocratic exercise, but rather a politically sensitive process for building co-responsibility and social ownership. In some strong, resilient, and effective evaluation systems are critical to strengthen our democracies, to redress course, to foster social ownership, and see palpable positive outcomes of public policy and decision making. So coming back to our three key words today, time scale and impact, we can say that resilient evaluation systems should be adaptive and well equipped to respond to unexpected changes. A resilient evaluation system should allow for a snapshot, a, a snapshot assessments of a particular decision or action, a sort of an account of the past and also be visionary, forward-looking, scenario building to reflect, redress, change course, and in doing so, reinvent the future. So this community is about reinventing the future. But what are the enables, enablers for resilient and effective evaluation system? I would also mention very quickly, three, planning, institutional capacity and rel reliable data. The enablers that I just mentioned should also foster greater cooperation among and within countries. The challenge therefore lies in the ability of evaluation ecosystems to be institutionalized, predictable, systematic, independent, reliable, and allow for comparability, of course. But at the same time, it is, this is very important to be adaptive, context sensitive, flexible, and open to innovation. This is perhaps how we can define resilience and effectiveness of evaluation processes. So in closing, we cannot simply assume that crises and emergencies are the new normal and that is a manifest destiny and remain in a state of paralysis. I would strongly argue that human-made crises should have human-made solutions. And we have a shared responsibility, a role to play for a renewed social contract or contracts. As late Kofi Annan used to say, I am a stubborn optimist. We cannot afford the luxury of pessimism. I know that we can look at the future with hope and not with despair, with responsibility and not with indifference. And we are gathered here today because we are not indifferent. The evaluation community has a vital role to play in rebuilding trust in institutions and democracies, in fostering accountability and designing prospects for a better future to close the gap between our aspirations and rights and what it is possible. 
that's what good politics are about. That's what development is about. And allow me here to close with a poem from the great Canadian poet, singer, and composer, Leonard Cohen. And he says, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I thank you for your patience and for your attention. <laughs>